Excellent. All right. Hello, everybody, and thanks for coming. I'm very excited to be here with, with some slides. Um, happy to be here in New York and, and at this great event. Uh, happy Columbus Day, too. It's one of the many better alternatives, I think, to celebrate than who we're actually celebrating. But uh, today, I want to mostly talk to you uh, about deep learning for enterprise. You might ask yourself, what is deep learning, and do I really need to know much about it? And the answer kind of depends on what kind of company you have and what kind of data you have. Deep learning is a set of algorithms that is really not that different to machine learning in general. It can do anything that general machine learning can do, and in many cases better. But it really shines when you have unstructured data. So what kinds of uh, data are unstructured? So it started with speech recognition. Uh, in really, like 10 years ago, a lot of speech recognition didn't work. And then deep learning came around in 2010 and actually enabled speech recognition to get an improvement in accuracy to a point where now we don't even think it's that special anymore that we can talk uh, to Siri or to our iPhone or Android phones and so on. So that was the first revolution uh, that deep learning enabled. Uh, and the second one then was in computer vision. And that's one that I'll talk about a lot today where we essentially can now very accurately identify objects and images. And I'll show how easy it is now to train your own image classifier, image automatic image labeler today. And then the third uh, revolution that's actually really happening right now is using natural language processing to train these models and automate different tasks, essentially extracting structured information out of your unstructured data. So how does it work? Well. Uh, 15 minutes is a little short to really explain that in detail, but the main difference between machine learning and uh, deep learning is that in deep learning you can give it raw data, for instance, just a bunch of images with just the pixels and the label that you care about, and then the deep learning algorithms essentially learn how to represent that data, that pictures might have small edges uh, on them or in them and how these edges are composing different parts of objects and then more complex objects are generated in each so-called layer of these deep neural network type of architectures. And so the main difference here is you don't need an expert into, in your domain uh, for understanding and representing that data in order to give it to a final classifier. It will actually learn all of that automatically. So. Let me show you a couple of examples of what we can now do. So the first one is in general image classification. So here I can show you a couple of things. We basically trained one classifier that has a thousand different classes. Uh, it can essentially find anything from aircrafts to an ambulance and alligator and so on. And you can very easily use it with three lines of Python code right here. And it you know, also know, knows, uh, also knows a bunch of different types of uh, dogs and different other kinds of species, or classifying website images, or combination locks, and so on. But of course, those are specific pre-trained, uh, as a pre-trained set of 1,000 classes. What you might care about is very different. Maybe you're a car company, you want to see in social media, how often do people post pictures of my car brand? And so what we enabled you to do, um, that was one of the first things we worked on and launched uh, late last year, is essentially a training interface that all you need to do to use it is essentially drag and drop a couple of images. So let's say we have here a couple of Audi images. And all we need to do is we take them, drag and drop them, into the browser and give it the label Audi. And then we'll have maybe another type of car, BMW. We take a bunch of BMW images and drag and drop those in there. And since I'm also from Silicon Valley, we've got to have Tesla in there. You don't see them very much in New York, but they're all over the place in Palo Alto. And so here we have, again, couple of different images of Teslas. We drag and drop those in here. And then uh, on, this, on this side, you can essentially uh, de decide whether you want to share your data and or your classifier. Of course, most companies don't want to ever do that. So the default is private. You don't even need to create an account uh, to, to create one. But if you don't create an account, then it will automatically be public. So be careful. Um, so now I give this classifier a name, car brands. 
and then I click on upload and train, and now these are these get sent back to our classification engine, and depending on the speed of the Wi-Fi, oh, it looks promising, um, we will now send those uh, to uh, GPU infrastructure. One of the reasons why these algorithms work so well is that they're actually much more complex. They do a lot better data transformations of your raw inputs, and so you need to have faster machines also to train them in a very efficient and fast way. So before I could even finish the sentence, and while we're all sitting here, we now trained our own image classifier for these three specific classes. And we can test it uh, both via an API, so just three lines of Python code, or we can drag and drop also and see if it actually works. So here we have an unseen BMW picture. We have a picture of an Audi and a picture of a beautiful Tesla and basically classifies these correctly. And the way I was able to do this is actually by uh, one of many tricks, so-called transfer learning. This model has actually seen a lot of other kinds of objects, millions of images before in its lifetime. And now we basically say, all right, ignore or remember in general how you represent images, but now actually distinguish these specific three classes. So what can you do with this, and, and how does this change things? So you might be an ad agency, and you basically placed an ad, and now your customer asks, well, how often, for instance, when I was advertising for the soccer game, how often was my logo actually seen in each frame? So you might now go manually and say, all right, let's just hire five people and ask them, look at every single frame, and every time you see in that frame the company logo, say yes, and then you can do that. Or you can just run a classifier, and we'll essentially automate that task for you. Um, there, you might be able to still do it for a couple of hours of, of soccer game video footage. But if you now want to find your company logo in all of Instagram or all Twitter images, that's going to be quite impossible. And so this is, again, another use case for a classifier where you can now automatically sift through uh, all of Instagram and find your company logo. Uh, what's exciting is there are actually use cases where it takes humans many years, up to eight years or so, to study, uh, in particular in, in radiology and medicine in general, uh, in order to be able to make certain visual distinctions. So this one is a classifier for diabetic retinopathy by a European SaaS company called CareSharing. And they essentially are running a clinical trial now with this algorithm that essentially classifies whether you see diabetic retinopathy in an eye scan or not. This is something that most of us can't do, and those people who do it, they studied many years to be able to make those distinctions accurately, and you can now literally drag and drop images into browser and automate a lot of those kinds of tasks and initially uh, improve sort of the accuracy that humans uh, have on this task. But of course, not all of us use images in our companies or our day-to-day -day lives uh, for, for the kinds of data sets uh, that we have lying around in our company. But one thing that almost all of us do is deal with natural language. We're speaking right now, and whenever you interact with your customers, you do that in a variety of different ways through natural language. And so uh, we have a bunch of uh, different things that uh, we could analyze and I could show you. We can automatically answer, for instance, customer support requests you're like, oh, that's essentially this kind of knowledge base article, and you send that. Like, how do I log back into my account when I forgot my password? You get that email hundreds of times a day, potentially depending on how large your company is, and you can basically, whenever you see it, and you see a certain knowledge base article being linked uh, to uh, an, an answer to an email, you can essentially automate that. You can also even predict uh, your social media engagement before you send out the message. You could essentially ask, is this really an engaging message in terms of the photo or uh, the text? And the computer will run an internal A-B test based on all the past experience of marketing messages that you've seen. And uh, the really amazing thing, and the reason why I'm saying there's a bit of a new breakthrough coming up now, is that we can actually solve a lot of different NLP problems now with the same kind of deep learning model. And this is one that We've just developed a couple 
of months ago um, at MetaMind, and it's one model that solves a lot of different NLP problems. So in natural language processing, we have a lot of different sub-problems. Some require logical reasoning, uh, such as this one here, and you can think about how you would solve this right now. Um, others are more fuzzy. We want to classify sentiment or people saying positive things about uh, my brand or not. Uh, and others, again, actually want to extract, for instance, company uh, information or company names from a large text, which is something that I think Bloomberg would be very interested in, for instance. So here, um, I give you a bunch of facts. And now I ask you, what color is Bernard? Now, how would you solve that? That's right. And so uh, we have here a couple of people already said yellow. And what's exciting here is uh, we basically did not have to explain to this model anything about the world. We didn't have to tell it what are names, what people names, color names, uh, and other group names, or anything like that. All we had to give it is a bunch of stories of this nature with questions and the right answers associated with those stories. And then what the model did is actually going over these different facts and then paying attention uh, to specific facts. So I asked the question with colors Bernard, the first fact that it pays attention to is, well, Bernard is a frog. But it also realizes this isn't enough yet to answer your question. There was nothing when you're asking for colors, and I still haven't really seen any color. And again, this is all implicit. The only thing that this model really sees are these stories and this. This is what how the model represents the input. Just a bunch of vectors. But then it basically realizes, OK, after the first one, I don't know enough. Maybe I have new information now, though. After, after all, I now know that Bernard is a frog. So maybe I go over these facts again in the second episode and pay attention to anything that's mentioning also a frog. So here, Lily is a frog. New information, still not enough to answer this question. However, now I can look for Bernard, frog, and Lily. So I go over my inputs again, now with different things conditioned on different facts and see, all right, Lily is yellow. That is probably enough to answer the question. And now I can basically answer this. So that is one example. Um, I can also ask, instead of something where you need logical reasoning over sets and things like that, I can ask, what is the sentiment of this sentence here? Despite the glowing reviews, this movie wasn't an especially engrossing experience. Kind of a tricky example, movie reviews often try to have double negatives or interesting constructions. And here, the model also very accurately predicts that this is indeed a negative sentence. Um, we can instead ask, what are the named entities and of, of, this, of this story, for instance, and it'll essentially find locations, organization names, people names, and things like that. And what's really amazing, too, is because we're making zero assumptions uh, about language or about really what this input is. In fact, this input could also be images for all we care about. Um, we can also uh, ask what's the sentiment for this kind of text. Again, as long as the algorithm has seen, as long as you as a data scientist have the data and you can ask questions about it and you know the right answers during training, this model will essentially classify this. And I will not make a fool of myself and try to read that, but um, hopefully some of you can. It's kind of an interesting, interesting sentence. All right, so uh, I was asked to go into a little bit of detail, so bear with me if uh, you're more on the entrepreneurial side and less on the technical side, but just uh, one slide on, on a few of the details of how this model actually works. Um, and again, sorry if you're not familiar with this, this is going to be quite technical. So the main idea here is we have so-called uh, recurrent neural networks, uh, networks that uh, essentially at every time step have a new input to a hidden state, which is essentially a vector. And we have some inputs. We read the inputs. And then we have a question. For instance, where is the football in this case? And now, with this question in mind, we condition a so-called neural attention mechanism that can retrieve different memories from different time steps over the input. So here, for instance, I ask, where is the football? And now, based on this question, we reevaluate and look at all the different facts that we've seen that are relevant right now, and then put those into another sequence model, and basically update a memory. And at the end of each memory uh, pass over these different inputs, 
we basically say, do we know enough to answer this question that we are conditioning on? And once we do think we have enough, we essentially give this to an answer module, and that answer module will then just spit out the answer. All right, with that, I want to conclude. Basically, if you have unstructured data, be it speech, images, or text, deep learning is likely going to be the answer to automate and extract structured information out of that. Thank you. This was great. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned that uh, deep learning sort of accelerated in 2010. Um, we had uh, Professor Jan LeCon, currently uh, head of AI at Facebook, a few months ago, and uh, it sounded like his version of the story was was probably that he had my words, not his, but totally in obscurity for decades, and in, in, in now, you know, finally was a big moment of deep learning. You mentioned GPU. What else happened? Why is this happening now versus two or three decades ago? Um, yeah, it's kind of amazing. Jan, actually, so I, I met him this morning, too. And uh, he's been really going at this uh, for many decades. Uh, and, and now it really is all paying off uh, incredibly well. So there are really three main factors of why deep learning has made such a comeback. Because uh, you're right, some of the very basic algorithms have been around uh, for, for many decades. So the first one is we have enough data. Uh, because we're not giving these algorithms our prior knowledge about the problem. So I could build a cat image classifier by saying, I know that it are whiskers, and maybe I see, should see two eyes or maybe a tail, and they would probably look something like this in the geometry and things like that. Because we're not giving it any such information, it needs to see all the variants. Cats can be black, cats can be red, and, and so on, brown. And if without seeing enough of the variance of the data, the algorithm won't be able to sort of magically understand uh, what's going on in your data. So the first one is larger data sets. And now in order to really go through them and really ingest all that information from these large data sets, you also need larger models. And to train those, you need faster machinery. And so for especially for computer vision, you need GPUs, um, which can be a pain to set up in your own uh, data center and so on. Um, and for natural language processing, it's also very helpful to have, at the very least, multi-core CPUs. And then the third one, which I think is also important, is that we did have a lot of small algorithmic advances. Each may have only given you 2 or 5% uh, in terms of accuracy, but that's how you went from systems that were in the 60s or 70s that just weren't ready to be used in a production system to something that actually works uh, in, in real life. Okay, great. And um, so if data is um, one of the key aspects here, and you alluded to that a little bit, um, in an enterprise context, so ideally you would want to get the corporate data, but also get external data. How, how do you, which obviously uh, is going to make, you know, certain people scream within corporations. How do, you, how do you think about that? And if you cannot get the corporate data, how do you train the algorithms? That's a great question. So. The data is a huge piece of it, right? It's garbage in, garbage out, as, as most of you all know in, in general data science, right? And so um, there are actually a broad variety of things, ways that we deal with this. For some things, for instance, we're collecting our own data, we're paying for it, we're deduplicating, cleaning, labeling it ourselves. So for instance, it sounded like a gimmick in the beginning, but a lot of people are asking us to do food classification for general sort of obesity, diabetes kinds of applications, uh, fitness, and so on. Uh, and so we collected our own food data set with hundreds of classes uh, and basically just sell the classifier as is. But then there are other data sets that we will never get and uh, we won't ever get in the future unless we really change, which is medical, for instance. So uh, one of our biggest partners, VRAD Virtual Radiologic, who are the largest teleradiology provider in the United States. And they have an amazing treasure trove of, of data, for instance, for intracranial hemorrhage, so classifying rain bleeds in uh, 3D volumes or head CT scans. And so with them, we really have to partner. And, and then the ideal scenario, which is actually the case uh, for VRED, we're then allowed to also sell those classifiers afterwards. But uh, the most common case is companies just have their own data set, they have the expertise, they give it to us, and it won't be shared with anybody ever. Um, Thank you. Let me open to questions. One in the back. 
Yeah, um, I have a question about the sentiment analysis. So, for, um, for instance, sometimes uh, a same text can be seen as positive or negative. Can you configure your algorithm in order to ingest this, uh, this context? Um, yeah, so there are lots of different ways you can condition these models on different contexts. Uh, sarcasm is a good, good example. A lot of people want to be able to classify sarcasm, and really it's, it's more than, than just going based on the text, right? So I could have two friends, and one says, I was coding all weekend, what a great weekend, and one is like, hates his job and really didn't like it, and the other one just loves programming, and so it, it was very positive. So for those kinds of things, you really need to have the right kind of data set where you collected the right structure and actually know something about either the social graph or people and, and what they do. Um, but it's very easy to condition the models on different things. It's kind of similar to the question you can essentially add to the question, what's the sentiment for this organization or for this vertical or something like that. Lady in front, Helena. What's the limit of, of the layering of successive Q&A processes? Um, so I guess there, there's some ambiguity in that question in the sense that uh, in, in deep learning, we often think of layers in terms of neural network layers. Uh, there's actually, uh, the models are getting deeper and deeper, and especially the sequence models are actually have a depth that depends on, depending on how you define depth, depends on uh, the number of words that you have in, in your story. So it could be in the hundreds or in the thousands. So there's almost no limit there. Um, in terms of uh, the questioning, you can have up to three supporting facts. There's, there's a specific data set that Facebook published uh, called the Bobby data set, um, where they have different stories uh, about positional reasoning or questions about positional reasoning or questions that require two or three supporting facts. So those things we know we can do for sure. And then we're also experimenting a little bit with even more complex stories, but the, the jury is still out of how many sort of supporting facts do you need to be able to answer one question. At the very least, three works for sure quite well. Hi, Richard. I have a question for you. So um, in your model, you're, you're putting in the classifier or the text, right? Does the model ever tell you, like, OK, I looked at all the, all the images, but you know, I also noticed another brand, which let's say you didn't, cl you, know, you didn't put in the name or the brand. Would it recommend? Does it do any recommendation? Sorry, so you train it with, let's say, 10 classes, and now you show it a picture of uh, an image that wasn't in one of those 10 classes? That yeah, what happens when you put an image of you know, some other brand, like that's, Hyundai? That, that's actually a good question, which is a big confusion for a lot of people who use the online demo. So thanks for asking that. Um, a lot of people kind of hope that it would somehow know, but all this model was ever trained to do is predict those 10 classes. And if you show it something like, Let's say yeah, I train it on you know, five different cat and dog breeds, and now I show a diabetic retinopathy image. And I'm like, what do you do with it? There's just no way it will ever know that, oh, this is probably uh, you know, an eye scan and from, from somewhere else. So the only, way, um, the only thing you can do, which is actually something that we started doing for food and some other enterprise classifiers, is to have an unknown class. We just essentially take all of uh, ImageNet, there's a large uh, academic data set of, with tens of thousands of different categories, and essentially subsample from all of those and say, uh, for every, every training iteration, we will randomly sample one of those images from tens of thousands of different classes and say, this is one of the unknown uh, objects. And that is one way to, to enable algorithms to at least say, I don't know, it's not one of these 10 that you have. Good. Time for just one last question. Um, so in terms of maintaining the performance of such a system, it sounds like you would need to keep for, uh, creating training set. Like, is that the case? And how much training, you know, because you need humans to classify all of these. Can you just speak to that? Sure. It, it highly depends on whether you're the distribution of the things you want to classify is actually changing over time, and it's like non-stationary that way. So sentiment, for instance, has a large chunk that doesn't change. You know, the words awesome, great, wonderful, amazing won't change that quickly. But there are some things that change in context or that really depend on uh, 
new slang that, that comes out. So I could say this is the shit, and that's actually pretty positive, right? And so as new slang develops, you do want to update, for instance, your sentiment classifiers. And so uh, in order to facilitate that, you can actually, like on, on this website, you can just click whenever it makes a mistake. For instance, it's very easy to click and teach it uh, and when it makes mistakes. And uh, in general, I think that is, is something that, you know, if your data requires it. So retinopathy scans are likely not to change that much unless you have a new machine where you know, now the scans have a slightly different uh, visual, uh, yeah, sli look slightly different. But in many other things, you do want to keep your classifiers updated uh, to change, change the distribution. Great, wonderful. Thanks, Richard. Thank you.